Good morning, everyone. This Sunday, February 7th, first Sunday of the month, where we join together in worship, but also join together at the Lord's table this morning in our service. So welcome to all of you who join us from the land of the internet and to be with us here who gather at the church this morning. A couple uh, readings here. First of all, they're, they're both from the New Testament. One from Luke chapter 22, I'm reading verses 7 to 20. Then the day of unleavened bread came on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make pre preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare? They asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters and say to the owner of the house. The teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And then from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, I'm reading verses 31 to 35. This was also at the same Passover meal. Jesus told them this very night, you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of his flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered. This very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all of the other disciples said the same. Let's give God thanks for his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. How you teach us, how you humble us, how you show us our desperate need for you. So we pray, Lord a blessing upon your message and your word this morning, that it reaches every one of our hearts and souls. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I shared a good portion of the message today in a Facebook post back in April last year. It wasn't a, a Sunday message, but it was kind of a pre-Easter post to familiarize people with what Passover meant and, and what it continues to mean to us today. Passover began as a Jewish holy day, but its significance still remains for us. Passover starts on the 15th day of Nisan, and it lasts for seven or eight days, usually in our month of April. Now, Nisan is a month, a Jewish month in the Hebrew calendar, and it's the first month of their religious year. Now, the word Passover has history to it. Some of it we know from the Bible. But a little background into its origins. It is known by some called the Pascal full moon. And that refers to the ecclesiastical or the religious full moon of the northern spring. And this is what gives us the future dates each year for Easter or Passover. The name Pascal is derived from a translation of the Aramaic meaning Passover. This is a can explain why we see the, the date of Easter change from year to year, because it's based on this full moon. It falls on various days. Because Easter falls on a Sunday after that March 21st 
spring equinox, Easter will always occur on a Sunday between March 22nd and April 25th. So if you're wondering why it bounces around, there you go. So on your calendars, you're going to see well, some of them, it'll show Easter. It'll show Good Friday. It may even show Passover. But Easter is not about what it has become for most of the world or a lot of the world. It's not about bunnies and it's not about chocolates and chickens. And, okay. Easter and Passover. These began as a holiday, if you can, uh, wish, or a holy day. A holy day that God had established and told the Jewish people to observe. The Jewish people, of course, were first known as Hebrews. And later, as a nation, they became Israel. God had told them to observe this particular holy day to make sure that they always remembered an extremely important event in their history. So what is that date in history? Passover. Is a date it celebrates the liberation of the Israelites from slavery from their Egyptian taskmasters over 3,000 years ago for us. If you've ever watched the old movie with a young Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner, the Hollywood version and the biblical account of the Ten Commandments, if you've seen that, probably it's four hours long on TV, you've already learned where Passover originally came from. In our Bibles, the book of Exodus picks up that story. It picks up the history of Abraham's descendants after they moved to Egypt because of a severe famine. And 400 years or more go by. And all the while, the Hebrews are staying in Egypt. The Jewish people were poor as they stayed there. And Pharaoh ended up making the Jewish people slaves. In Exodus chapter 2, through the chapter 12, it gives you the account of Moses and Pharaoh going head to head over the fate of over a million plus Hebrew slaves. We might recall there's 10 plagues that Egypt suffered because Pharaoh wouldn't allow the slaves to go free. The 10th and the final plague was one that broke Pharaoh. The 10th and final plague would go through Egypt and that every firstborn male in every family would die, even the firstborn of the, of the animals of the field. God had told Moses all about this. And it's in chapter 11 and chapter 12 of Exodus that we learn that an angel would pass over Egypt and kill all these firstborn males. Now back in this era of time, the young nation of Israel, animal sacrifice was common. We find its purpose in the Bible and in other religions too. Much of what we have in our Old Testament points to the New Testament, and Passover is a big pointer. God had commanded Moses that in order for his people to avoid the plague and not have their Hebrews see their firstborn die, that each house had to make a, a sacrifice. And there were precise instructions on how to kill the lamb, a perfect blemish free lamb and they were to take some of the blood and paint it up and down their doorposts of their homes and across the top of the doorpost and by them following God's commandment when the angel of death passed over Egypt that night when he seen the blood on the painted on the door frames he would pass over that home and not take the life of the firstborn the plague happened as we're told Pharaoh's son died he and many others, of course, would have been devastated. And they finally realized and decided that Moses' God was more powerful than any of the Egyptian gods. So Pharaoh let the people leave Egypt. And by some estimates, over a million and a half men, women, and children began their exodus out of Egypt, heading towards the land that was promised to their forefather Abraham. There is much, much more to the story. So give Exodus a read. But let's get back to Passover. As I mentioned earlier, this event with the Exodus became a holy day in the future. And God commanded Israel, the Jewish people, to observe Passover. And observe they did. Up until the time where we have Jesus in the New Testament, a thousand years had passed from the first Passover. 
Jews from all the surrounding countryside and tribes living all over the land that they had been given by God, they would make their journey into Jerusalem for Passover. So from the first Passover with Moses and the Jewish people escaping Pharaoh some 1,000 years ago, prior to that, sorry, 1,000 years prior to Jesus, we find ourselves in time when in the New Testament history, Jesus has entered the scene. He was Jewish, and so by law, of course, he's like many other Jewish people. He was coming to Jerusalem for that Passover celebration. The most famous of Passovers was the first one. And of course, this one in the New Testament where we, Jesus eats the Passover meal with his disciples. Some of the scriptures I shared earlier. And during this New Testament Passover, of course, we know that this is a Passover in which Jesus is crucified. It's no accident, it's no coincidence that Jesus died during Passover. Remember the lambs that were sacrificed for the first Passover, how their blood was used to avoid that tenth and final plague that God sent upon Egypt. Remember that blood is very important. The life of the creature, Scripture says, is in the blood. Let's keep that in mind as we continue. When we read the Gospels, the accounts of Jesus' last week on earth before his sacrificial death, when people speak of Jesus, we often refer to Jesus as a holy sacrifice that God has supplied to people, you and I, everyone behind us, everyone before us, and that by Jesus' blood we can receive forgiveness from God. We also refer to Jesus as the Lamb of God. There's these connections that are unavoidable. All those lambs and all those animals that we read about in the Old Testament, their, their blood, it bought a, a temporary forgiveness, if you like, one that would hold things over until the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus would come in the future. With the first Passover, the Jewish people were being freed from their slave masters, Pharaoh, and the nation of Egypt. Now a thousand years later, and Jesus in Jerusalem, he will become that holy and perfect, without blemish, sacrificial lamb of God. Jesus ends up dying exactly on Passover. It is Jesus' blood that now releases you and I as believers from our slave master. And it's not Egypt. Our slave master is our sinful natures. It is sin. And as we accept Jesus as our Savior, it's his blood that's painted over the, our hearts, the door frames of our souls, if you like. His blood washes away our sins. And in time when future judgment comes, we as believers will pass through judgment and we'll find eternal life in the new heaven and earth. Passover in the Old Testament pointed to Jesus, the Lamb of God. Jesus dies on Passover. And now Passover, for the devout Jew, is still remembered and revered for much the same reasons as it did 3,000 years ago. But when Jesus became the sacrifice for all of the world's sins, Passover has become something else for the rest of the world that are not Jewish. Most people will have heard tell of Jesus is dying on Good Friday and coming forth from the grave on Sunday. This is what we know as Easter. Passover and Easter, they go hand in hand for the person who believes that Jesus died for their sins. All of those animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, they were likened to a band-aid on an open wound. The real healing wouldn't happen. The real and total forgiveness of our sins wouldn't happen until God supplied the most holy and sufficient sacrifice, that being Jesus Christ. Jesus has healed the relationship between almighty and holy God and us, us in our sinful natures. So much of the Old Testament points to Jesus. The whole sacrificial system points to Jesus. The Old Testament scriptures state that there is no forgiveness of sin unless there is 
the shedding of blood. Thankfully, we don't have to sacrifice innocent animals anymore to have forgiveness of our sins. Jesus has done this for us. His holy blood covers all sin of all time. This is a gift from God. And in order for a gift to be useful, it has to be received. If anyone listening today hasn't accepted Jesus' sacrifice, the question remains is why? What holds you back? For no one has anything to lose by accepting forgiveness of their mistakes. And in these days of extra worry and stress and our world seems to be crumbling and out of control at times. But knowing that Jesus has us, knowing and believer that no matter what happens, the believer in Jesus will have life eternal. Well, I pray that each that hear this message today have asked Jesus into your lives. He left heaven to come on a mission. In the process of this mission, Jesus reveals God to us, shows us the way to God and, and heals this broken relationship between sinful humanity and holy God. Now, of course, Satan or the devil, he didn't want Jesus to do this. He didn't want Jesus to succeed. But Jesus won that battle. He came forth from the grave. God showing us that Jesus' sacrifice was totally acceptable and fulfilling. The devil doesn't want you to receive Jesus. So don't let the devil win. And I hope that the message will have helped people understand a bit more about Passover, about Easter, and in the importance of that holy day. Now, I did share some scriptures earlier. What was going on in this most memorable Passover that took place in the New Testament? The Passover where Jesus would end up being crucified. It's a thousand years after that first Passover. And Jesus is not only coming to observe Passover, but he's coming to be that sacrificial Passover lamb of God. Jesus had instructed the disciples to prepare a place for them to share that Passover meal. We only get a very brief description in the scriptures of what takes place in this meal. But there's a sequence to the meal. There's with different foods and different drinks, prayers. All of this takes much, much more time than a regular meal that you have with family or friends. In Luke's account of this historical meal, which is what we now base our communion service on. There's some significant things that are going on that we might overlook because, well, we've heard the stories before. Some of us many times. But as we pick up the reading I shared from Luke 22. Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and said, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. Jesus knew what was going to happen, yet he eagerly awaited a time, a time to finally reconcile his heavenly father with sinful humanity. As he shares the food and the drink, he makes a prophetic statement in verse 16. He says, I tell you, I will not eat again until it, eat this again with you until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Jesus wouldn't be eating and drinking to observe the Passover again until one day in the future. That one day in the future is still in our future. When he will gather all of his disciples, including you and I, as we eat and drink together. Some figure it's the marriage supper to take place after Jesus's future return. Maybe the entire world has been changed and now we'll find ourselves sharing this meal in the new kingdom of God that will have fully arrived. Verse 18 confirms this. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. It's a promise. 
It's a prophecy. So the Jewish people up to this point observed Passover as a special day that God had instituted so that they would remember God delivering them from the slavery that they endured under the Egyptians. And now you and I as Christians, we also remember some things during our communion service. We can recall and we can give thanks to God for creating us. The very basics. We also, in light of what has transpired in this once in all time event of Jesus' death and resurrection, we can give thanks to God for this sacrifice. He has given this to us, his own son, God in the flesh, to be our savior and our forgiveness. Without that sacrifice that God has made, we'd all be doomed to eternal separation from God. Luke states that Jesus said in verse 20, after the supper, he took the cup. This is the cup of a new covenant, a new agreement, a new cup, a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Poured out for not only those disciples, but for everyone who would believe. That cup and its contents would re resemble Jesus' blood that would soon be poured out for all of humanity. That this blood would be painted over the door frames of people's hearts and souls for all who would simply trust in Jesus Christ. Like the Jews who were spared in the first Passover, we who have accepted Jesus as sacrifice will pass through that future judgment. We'll pass through judgment and end up in the new kingdom of God. And that is why the gospel is called the good news. Because it ends well. It's good news to know that we are forgiven now. So we're thankful for what God has done for us. And knowing and believing this because Jesus has told us that we'll drink and we will eat with him in the future. The established kingdom of God. So we're given hope. For this event to come back, uh, to come to pass one day in our futures. Even though we have some difficult journeys in front of us. But here's a, a troublesome aspect of all this. There is the good news. No trouble there. A little scratchy this morning. The troublesome part is that Satan is there all the time in our hearts and minds. And he's lying to us and he's saying stuff like you're a sinner and there's no hope for you. Satan will get desperate. And even though he knows that you and I believe, he knows we are saved. But he'll keep beating away. Beating so that we feel hopeless in our struggle with sin. Jesus has already won the battle. And yes, you and I are sinners. We'll be sinners until we die. But this doesn't change the facts that Jesus has died for those sins. And we're forgiven. And Satan keeps banging away. Having many a Christian feeling defeated. And when we feel defeated, maybe we don't feel good enough or strong enough to share the good news. Or sometimes feeling like we're not even saved from our sins. That's how bad the beatings are. That's why I shared that second reading from about the Passover meal that as Jesus was sharing with his disciples. More, more likely, more familiar with this from Matthew's gospel. And, but I didn't share it to go over again what Jesus did. You know, the sharing of the, the cup and the bread. That's actually before that reading I shared. I shared that reading this morning to remind each of us about who Jesus ate this meal with. They were sinners too. One of them, Judas, who would soon betray Jesus and help hand Jesus over to those who wanted him dead. Of course, this didn't surprise Jesus. He knew what was to take place, even to the smallest of details. And after the meal in Matthew's account, Jesus told them, this very night, all of you will fall away on account of me. It was written in the Old Testament. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. 
So all of those closest to Jesus would abandon him. His disciples had been with him for three and a half years. This very night, some would be running away to save themselves. Peter even denying that he even knew Jesus three times. But this was just in the future, and Peter couldn't see that happening. He says, no way, Lord. Even if all the rest of them fall away, I never will. Jesus said, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Peter says, I'll never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Not us, not me. Well, as Satan reminds us of our sins, this group of disciples around Jesus eating the Passover meal, Jesus knowing who would, would betray him, who would disown him, who would run away from him. They're all sinners, just like us. And my point here is that Jesus dies for these men who were closest to him. And even though they would betray and deny and desert him. If Jesus was willing to have them at the fellowship meal. The Passover meal. Does not make sense that us who never seen or lived with Jesus for three and a half years. That he would accept us if we ask him into our lives. He's been willing to die for you and I as sinners. All of our sins are forgiven. Every one of them. It has to be. Or there's nothing true about any of it. The sins of the past, the sins of today. The sins of the future. This is good news for those of us who will admit and confess our sins to God. Because we can confess really, that we do deny Jesus. Maybe we don't deny him in saying that we don't believe, but we deny Jesus by not living for him as we continue to live for ourselves. We deny Jesus by listening to Satan and his lies, and at times we live defeated lives when all the time Jesus still loves us despite our failures. Jesus had told the disciples before they even denied or deserted him. He says, you'll all run. But after I've risen, meet up with me. Verse 32, but after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. After they had failed him, Jesus still wanted them with him. So for you and I in this very moment, keep the faith. Despite the failures, the sins that we have committed. Jesus has died and he's risen from the grave. He's the Passover lamb. And his promise to us is if we'll place our trust in him, in his sacrifice, his promise is, hey, meet me in the future, in the new kingdom of God, and we'll share a meal like never before. It's his promise to us for the future. And that gives us hope for today. So this Jewish holy day called Passover, don't pass over that holiday on your calendar. It's still very meaningful and vital for you and I to understand today and to lay hold of these promises, lay hold of Jesus' sacrifice as he has spared us. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice that Jesus has given to us. We thank you, Lord, for the Passover, how you showed the world your mighty hand to save your people. And a thousand years later, Lord, you showed as Jesus came forth from the grave, you showed the world your power over everything. We thank you, Lord, that you invite us to share this meal and to remember and recall what you have done on that first Passover, but also as Jesus became the Passover lamb. Be with us, Lord, in our service as we remember and praise you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
We're now gathered together for the communion service. Could I have the deacons and servers uh, come forward this morning? There's some sanitizer there in the middle of the table. Let's give thanks to God for the table. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this table and for the invitation to each of us. Each of us as sinners, but you still want relationship. You still want fellowship with us. On our own, none of us have the right to be here. But because of Jesus Christ, the sacrificial lamb, his blood being poured and shed for our forgiveness, we can be here. We thank you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Also from Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day. I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus took bread, ordinary bread of his day, and he wanted each of his disciples to break a part off and have part of it, a fellowship meal together, his bread resembling his body that would soon would be destroyed, would be broken, would be killed for not only them, but all of humanity. Remember, he was doing this, wanting them to partake in something with him, even though they were going to desert him. They were going to deny him. Dorothy, would you give thanks for the bread, the body of Christ? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you formed your son to come and be like us, except for our blood is full of sin. And Jesus' body and blood and holiness is just so much more pure than we are that he could come and take his body and make us pure enough to be in heaven with him. Thank you, Lord. Jesus also took the cup contained wine of the day. But he says this cup would now represent his blood. The contents would represent his blood that would be poured out. Poured out for those 12. Poured out for the Jewish people. Poured out for those of us who are not Jewish. Simply by believing in this new covenant, this new agreement, not based on law, not based on keeping or being able to keep all the laws or the rules, based on simply trusting in Jesus Christ. The cup, the Lord's blood. Debbie, would you give thanks for the cup of Christ? Thank you, Lord, for the holy table, for the purpose of gathering together with you. Father God, I thank you for the sacrifice of your blood on the cross for us. 
and that you give us a home in heaven eternally with God. Thank you. Amen. Amen. I ask our servers to take us to, to serve the congregation. I ask the congregation to put their masks on while you're being served. The body of Christ, broken and given to each of us, eat of it and give thanks. And as we have eaten of the Passover lamb, let us also, as Jesus instructed, to share in the cup. Drink of this and give thanks, the blood of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time, for the privilege that we have been able to gather together to worship and praise you. Lord, we pray for the time ahead of us. We pray, Lord, for your protection, 
from COVID. Give us safe journeys in our travels. Be with those, Lord, in long-term care and, and in the hospital, and we pray for healing, for spiritual healing, for physical healing, for those who are broken, for thinking of those who have lost loved ones, either recently or, or wounds that have been cut really deep because of our losses in the past. We pray, Lord, for your comfort and strength for each one. Lord, we thank you for all those who put themselves in harm's way to, that you use to supply us with our daily needs. And so we ask a continued blessing upon each of them. We pray, Lord, that you would guide us and that you would teach us. Open up our hearts and minds to receive you and your word and your promises. We praise you and we thank you when we make this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Blessings on your day and upon your week ahead of you. Be careful in the storm and don't forget to wash your hands. God bless. Thank you.